Hello and welcome to this week's Macker to Macker. It's great to be back in my own living room. Uh, it's lovely that you're out there in yours. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got a really fantastic show uh, lined up ahead uh, for tonight. I'll be welcoming for the first time to Macker to Macker Adua Ando, and the wonderful actress and film actress, play actress, radio performer, all round great good egg. I'll be introducing her properly in a minute. And also welcoming back the fantastic Catherine Fulpot, who you've heard a few times on Macker to Macker already. Well, the idea behind Macker to Macker is to pass the baton on Macker to Macker. Maker to maker, which is the nearest English equivalent of the word macker. And the word macker just means the national poet of Scotland. And for the moment, that's me. I follow Liz Lockhead and Edwin Morgan. Had Edwin lived, he would have been 100 this very year on the 27th of April. The word macker is the old word for bard, but it didn't exclusively, it wasn't exclusively used to describe Scottish poets. It was also used to describe Chaucer by Dunbar. And in this series, we love the idea of passing the baton both within the program, between poetry and song. So the whole program has a, a rich and heady mix of poetry and song. And so to kick things off, I'm going to start with this wee offering, a poem called Brendan Gallagher. He was seven and I was six, my Brendan Gallagher. He was Irish and I was Scottish, my Brendan Gallagher. His father was in prison. He was a cat burglar. My father was a Communist Party full-time worker. He had six brothers and I had one, my Brendan Gallagher. He would hold my hand and take me by the river where we talk all about his family being poor. He'd get his mum out of Glasgow when he got older, a wee holiday, someplace nice, someplace far. I tell my mum about my Brendan Gallagher, how his mum drank and his daddy was a cat burglar. And she'd say, why not have him round to dinner? No, no, I'd say, he's got big holes in his trousers. I like meeting him by the burn in the open air. Then one day after we'd been friends two years, one day when it was pouring and I was indoors, my mum says to me, I was talking to Mrs Moyer who lives next door to your Brendan Gallagher. Didn't you say his address was 24 Novar? She says there are no Gallaghers at 24 Novar. There never have been any Gallaghers next door. And he died then, my Brendan Gallagher, flat out on my bedroom floor, his spiky hair, his impish grin, his funny flapping ear. Oh, Brendan. Oh, my Brendan Gallagher. Well, that's my wee offering for now. And I'd like to welcome into my Zoom room, Adua Ando. Hello, Jackie. Hello, lovely to see you there. Lovely to see you too. <laughs> Looking forward <laughs> to hearing you. And I'd also like to welcome in Catherine Philfort. Hi. <laughs> Hello, Catherine. Nice to see you. Really lovely to see you both. Adjo is um, a dear, a dear and wonderful friend of mine. We've been friends since we were in our 20s, Adjo, haven't we? Our friendship goes decades. back. Decades. And decades, it goes back a long, long way. And, and, yeah. during, that, and during that time, I've had the, that wonderful feeling that you get when you're a very, very proud friend of seeing you and meeting you in so many different roles, in so many different ways, on stage, on television, listening to you in the radio. One of my last great pleasures was seeing you play Richard II um, at, at the Globe, which was an absolutely fantastic, phenomenal production, all women of color that you directed yourself. The music yeah. was sublime and composed by Dominique Lejean. It was just one of those, those productions that just left you with, with shivers and you just wanted everybody you knew to be able to get a chance to see it. And as you were sitting watching it, you're thinking, these people missing out here <laughs> because they're not getting a chance to see it. But I've also felt very proud watching you in Doctor Who, watching you in Casualty. And not that long ago when you came to visit my mum, 
in hospital, I was bemused to find a whole trail of nurses following me down the <laughs> corridor and my dad watching kind of shocked. It was like life, life imitating art, imitating <laughs> life. And you're, you're, you absolutely adore uh, Shakespeare. And one of the wonderful things about having you on this, on this program today, Macro to Macro, is that you're going to be sharing with all of us your enthusiasms for a number of really wonderful writers. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, of which you, my dear friend, I am extremely, extremely proud of because you are up there in the top, top wonderful writers, Jack. So um, I'm very, very thrilled to be here with you and with Catherine, whose voice is sublime. So what a top lineup. <laughs> We're going to have fun, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Ash, would you like to start by reading us a, a, a few of your favourite poems? I will. Um, so, when you asked me to think about um, joining you on this Maka to Maka journey, um, I, I was thinking about uh, poems and writing that uh, have been significant for me in my life, which made me sort of do a chronological literary sweep. So we're starting at the beginning, sort of. So this little chunk is um, childhood and teens, really, I suppose. So we're starting with Puppy and I by A. A. Milne, which my father used to come and read to me and my brother at the end of the bed quite often. It was his favourite, so he read it quite often. And I love it too now. Puppy and I. I met a man as I went walking. We got talking, man and me. Where are you going to, man? I said. I said to the man as he went by. Going to the village to get some bread. Will you come with me? No, not I. I met a horse as I went walking. We got talking, horse and I. Where are you going to, horse, today? I said to the horse as he went by. Down to the village to get some hay. Will you come with me? No, not I. I met a woman as I went walking. We got talking, woman and I. Where are you going to, woman, so early? I said to the woman as she went by. Going to the village to get some barley. Will you come with me? No, not I. I met some rabbits as I went walking. We got talking, rabbits and I. Where are you going in your brown fur coats? I said to the rabbits as they went by. Down to the village to get some oats. Will you come with us? No, not I. I met a puppy as I went walking. We got talking, puppy and I. Where are you going this fine day? I said to the puppy as he went by. Up to the hills to roll and play. I'll come with you, puppy, said I. <laughs> That's it. Lovely. My dad always used to roll the R, so it's the law. You have to roll the R. Now, uh, quite different change of tone. This is Gerard Manley Hopkins. This is teenage angst. No worse there is none. No worse there is none. Pitched past pitch of grief, more pangs will, schooled at four pangs wilder ring. Comforter, where? Where is your comforting? Mary, mother of us, where is your relief? My cries heave herds long, huddle in a main, a chief woe, world sorrow, on an age-old anvil, wince and sing, then lull, then leave off. Fury had shrieked, no lingering. Let me be fell, force I must be brief. Oh, the mind, mind has mountains. Cliffs of fall, frightful, sheer, no man fathomed. Hold them, chief May, who ne'er hung there, nor does long our small durance deal with that steep or deep. Here, creep, wretch, under a comfort serves in a whirlwind. All life, death does end, and each day dies with sleep. Gerard Manley Hopkins. And this third one from this early life section, this is me uh, trying to uh, find somewhere to live uh, when I was a law student in, the, in 1981. 
And uh, as you can tell from my voice, can you tell what colour I am from my voice? No. So uh, I'd turn up somewhere and people would be horrified in Bristol. This is Bristol. Telephone Conversation by Wale Shinka. The price seemed reasonable. Location, indifferent. The landlady swore she lived off premises. Nothing remained but self-confession. Madam, I warned, I hate a wasted journey. I am African. Silence. Silenced transmission of pressurized good breeding. Voice when it came, lipstick coated, long gold rolled cigarette holder picked. Caught I was, foully. How dark? I had not misheard. Are you light or very dark? Button B, button A. Stench of rancid breath of public hide and speak. Red booth, red pillar box, red double tiered omnibus squelching tar. It was real. Shamed by ill mannered silence, surrender pushed dumbfoundment to beg simplification. A considerate she was, varying the emphasis. Are you dark or very light? Revelation came. You mean like uh, plain or milk chocolate? Her assent was clinical, crushing in its light impersonality. Rapidly, wavelength adjusted, I chose West African sepia, and as an afterthought, down in my passport. Silence for spectroscopic flight of fancy till truthfulness clanged her accent hard on the mouthpiece. What's that? Conceding, don't know what that is. Like brunette. That's dark, isn't it? They're not altogether. Facially, I am brunette, but madam, you should see the rest of me. Palm of my hand, soles of my feet are a peroxide blonde. A friction caused foolishly, madam, by sitting down has turned my bottom raven black. Uh, one moment, madam. Sensing her receiver rearing on the thunderclap about my ears. Madam, I pleaded, wouldn't you rather see for yourself? Wale Shienka. So he experienced pretty much the same stuff that I had experienced, I guess. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really amazing to hear that poem again. I remember it was one of the poems that we actually got at school. And I remember when Did our you? English, yes, I got it at school at 14. Wow. Uh, yeah. And I remember my English teacher, Mrs. Hughes, um, asking the class what they made of it and, and nobody could really understand the poem except except me and yeah. I understand I understood the the notion that people because people would often ask you if your bottom was the same color as the rest of you kind of rather perplexingly I, I could never quite get get that and, and they'd often ask to see the color of your palm of your hands as if by being a different color it meant that you would just be different colors all over it was really really strange and not mm. until I actually read that poem did I come across yeah. um, that in literature? And it, it was a really massive thing, um, isn't it? When you when you come across a kind of a mirror image of your own experience in literature and, and suddenly it, your life has made some kind of sense of. It's an enormous relief, isn't it? Because you, you stop thinking, it's just me. Uh, you know, um, I, I think that I think of at the moment is I was watching um, the cricket when it was raining on Monday and Michael Holding and... Uh, um, the, uh, the the woman cricketer Ebony and uh, Nasser Hussein were all talking about their experiences of racism and they're massively successful in their field and e e even to this day there's bits of you that goes oh that happened to you as well it's not just me um, so I and I think we can take enormous um, comfort in seeing our experiences validated in a way especially in something as solid as a, a piece of literature yeah. Um, yeah, because in your in the Gerald Menley Hopkins poem, there is that wonderful line, where is the comforting, the idea that, that we find, in it. and has that been the case for you um, for as far back as you remember, that you found comfort from poetry? Always, 
uh, yeah, always. I mean, the 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 um the A A Milne. That's 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 like three three or four, um, and uh, reading and literature and stories. I used to um, when I was little, I used to make books. I used to sew the spine, and I would colour them in, and I'd do quizzes and um, uh, dot to dots, and I'd write stories, and there'd be illustrations. There might be a fashion page or two. You know, I just liked. I liked the object um, and I liked diving into it and getting lost. I could spend days lying on my bed with a pack of juicy fruit chewing gum reading <laughs> generally the secret seven probably with the dodgy foreigner, but we skip over that bit. <laughs> that's the same. That's the same as me. But in, and in the A.A. Milne poem, the poem's really a search for finding the right friend. Um, yes, and, and the right playmate. Yes, yeah. the right the right playmate. And did you find that um, that you were searching in a sense for the right form and uh, to play with? Um, I uh, I was I was I was good at playing on my own. Uh, I was uh, very good at playing with my brother, and I did. I had very judicious friendship groups. Um, quite often they might change, um, but it, it was a sort of matter of self preservation that you would find the kids to play with that would give you the most entertainment, the most engagement, and the least grief. I mean, I'm sure that's all, I'm sure that's the same for all children, but I think, um, well, you know, we have a similar experience in that way, you, you in Glasgow and, and me in the Cotswolds, but when you are one, um, then you, you are sort of judicious about who you play with. Sometimes you're just grateful that someone will play with you. That's, an, that's another thing, so um, yeah. Do you remember being excluded from things or not invited to things? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there were there were lots of houses I wasn't allowed into because what would people say if they saw the coloured girl going in that house? Can't have her in. So there's a lot of that. Or friends going, come round, but but we have to be quick because mum will be back and you can't be here when she gets back. That's so there was that sort of thing. And then there were the other houses where the doors were flung wide open. It was like, yeah, help yourself, get a cup of tea. Yeah, there's some bread in the, you know. There were those houses as well. So it's a real mix. I, I remember having boyfriends. Um, and not being able to ever hold hands with anyone in case somebody saw, and because it was a really small community as well, so everybody knew everybody's business. There was lots of that. Um, parties generally, I think I was, of my friendship groups, I think I was invited to parties, or, or I didn't know about the parties I wasn't invited to. Not being allowed into people's houses, not being able to have any public displays of affection, those were the, those were the, the, the big things I remember. And, and how do you think you received that? I mean, did you take that inside? Did you, did you receive that internally? Or did you just understand that, that there was different roles that you had to play externally? I, I understood from about the age of th three. In fact, I remember making it. My grandmother came round with her best friend, Daphne. And I remember Daphne was wearing a, a lemon twin set and lovely, nicely permed hair. And she came with Nana to our house. And I remember... Um, looking at Daphne and thinking I have to make her like me so what will I do so I went upstairs and I got Mrs Tiki Winkle obviously because I could read it and I brought it down and I completely ignored my grandmother and went and plonked myself on her lap opened my book and read her the story and at the end of it she liked me so t two things there first I go how did a three-year-old already have that radar up that knew that I had to make people like me that there was something that about me that was unlikable or troublesome that I had to smooth out by showing you know how charming I could be and how brilliantly I could read at age three um, and then the other bit of me just I just go well done you thought of a plan you put it into operation it worked so so I'm sort of I'm sort of amazed at the resourcefulness and the, also um, horrified at the 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 alertness that already had caught on to that. Yeah. yeah. And did you did you find because when you were talking about the Gerald Manley Hopkins poem, which was really amazing, and you said you described that as being um, important to you during a period of teenage angst, did you did you find that you rebelled against some of those things of having to be a version of when you were a teenager, or did that become more uh, problematic in a way? No, it didn't become more problematic. I became a punk. Punk rock saved my life. <laughs> um, I'm still a punk. I'm just aged. But uh, <laughs> um, my dad uh, used to love the Chieftains. Uh, my dad played in folk bands and he 
like he's never my dad's a musician my nephew's a musician my brother's a musician my grandmother on my father's side was a musician I'm a bit crap but they're all very good um and so we went around folk clubs a lot we used to go up to um there was a folk club in a pub called uh, in a in a little seaside village called Sandhead which was near Stranra and we used to camp up um just above um the beach the cows would come through regularly and trash the tents um just outside of Sandhead so that we could go to the folk club anyway dad loved the chieftains John Peel on his 10 till midnight show on Radio One used to play a lot of the chieftains in with you know whoever else Robert Wyatt and this new thing called punk so dad would listen to the chieftains and I caught on to punk so that's how I my dad made me a punk wow so this that was a rebellious thing yeah <laughs> I didn't know that Ange. I didn't know that at all Did you? No, no. I, didn't, oh. I didn't know about Stranraer either and that lovely Did you not? Another, another lovely Scottish oh. Scottish link yeah but this seems yeah. like a great moment to to bring Catherine Philpot back into the room into the zoom room with us hi Catherine because Catherine uh, you're currently studying textiles and printed textiles at Cardano College in Glasgow, but your love of folk music um, began through listening to Scottish folk songs in particular with your dad. And so in that sense, you share a, a link I didn't even know that you, that you had before Adjo started talking. How brilliant. Um, which is kind of lovely. And that's, that's the magic I love about these things. You know, you can tell it's just on the moment and and uh, and unscripted because we just discover things as we go along and that's really that's life for us isn't it Catherine yeah definitely I think dad's just must love folk that, that's just a common denominator here you know yeah we've all got singing dads <laughs> absolutely absolutely yes so Catherine what song did you pick to sing first of all for us so first I'm going to do the Loch Tay boat song um just because I feel like some of the colourful imagery within this song is very similar to Under the Days. And that's the poem that I've linked it to. Yes, yes, um, yes, great. It says, when I was reading that, I just sort of, there were bits of it when you think about little bits of imagery with colour and nature and stuff within this song. I thought I'd pick this one. So. <laughs> Lovely. Fantastic. <clears throat> great. Take it away, Catherine. <laughs> when I've done my work of day, and I roll my boat away in the waters of Loch Tay as the evening light is fading and I look upon Ben Lord where the And I dream on to bright eyes with a melting mouth below. She's my beauteous neon robe, my joy and sorrow too. And although she is untrue, well. For my heart's a boat in tow, and I'd give the world to know why she means to let me go as I sing Giddy Neon Roy. Has more glamour, I declare, than all the dresses red from Kilen to Aberfeldy, be they lint, white, brown, or gold, be they blacker than the snow. They are no more worth to me than the melting flakes of snow. And her eyes are like the gleam 
For the sun lights are a mystery, and the songs the fairies sing seem like songs she'd sing at milking. But my heart is full of woe, for last night she bade me go. And the tears begin to flow as I sing Hiddy Hodo. <laughs> How fabulous. Wasn't that fantastic? Really beautiful. Really really beautiful. <laughs> it's wonderful that the that song just takes you on a journey. Yeah. Through, through Aberfeldy and other places and it's wonderful when you recognize particular places and you you picture them um, mm -hmm. my friend had gone a bit of a road trip along the highlands and then we'd found this map and we found Killen and then Aberfeldy and we're finding all the different parts from that song like oh, this is so exciting we can actually picture it now it's incredible yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and songs are kind of maps in our lives aren't they a bit like poems in our lives like Adjo read those first three poems um, because they meant a lot to her when she was younger. And in fact, you, your whole reading, Adria, you planned out in a, in, a, in a way, taking us in a way through your life. Um, yeah. and, and it's interesting, songs do that too, don't they? they? They form a kind of rough and strange chronology of our lives. A different song will take us straight back to a particular moment in, in time. Absolutely. I was thinking as well, um, when you were singing, Catherine, just how uh, nature uh, is an enormous comfort for us, yeah. you know, um, and it, um, it the, 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 the unchangingness of it, uh, um, I mean, obviously it changes through the seasons, but it's constant presence and the, the solidness of it, the realness of it, um, is, a, is, is often a real comfort to a wounded heart or a wounded spirit. Um, and that, yes, that just made me really think of that when you were saying It's a nice constant to have, really. <laughs> you know, yeah. you you can go and sit and you can look at trees and flowers and it's lovely and it comforts you and it's just it's so nice yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Fantastic. it's interesting it's interesting because these particular times that we're living through we're all in need of comforts and it seems to me that we're in need of different kinds of comforts to what we might have been in need of before this particular uh crisis um the kind of comforts that remind us actually who we are and and what we're about and it reminds us of the essence of ourselves of yeah. of of the desire and the need to speak out about things that, that that distress us so we're living in extraordinary tinderbox times as well where people are very alive and um, to to the moments that we're in and um, which which kind of brings me on to the next piece that you're going to to read Adjua. um which is from the, the wonderful African-American writer, June Jordan, uh, who is an amazing essayist and poet and political thinker and inspiration uh, for many. I remember once uh, introducing her in Camden Town Hall and the queue formed right round the hall. So I had to actually introduce her twice that night <laughs> because um, people just waited, they waited a couple Desperate. of hours. Hear yeah. her again, and that night yeah. she was on till about one o'clock in the morning, and I, I just stayed and, and introduced her twice. But she's 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 amazing. So why have you picked June Jordan, Adrian? What what does she mean to to you? Well, she 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 means that time for me, that time when we were young and fizzing, fizzing with ideas and curiosity and hungry to hear. Uh, about the possibilities for our lives and to see the paths that other women of colour um, had taken. And I suppose, I don't know, I think I've, I've, I, I seem to remember being particularly inspired by African American and African women writers at that time, and also by my peers. Um, you know, uh, just all of us trying to, it, 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 it's like we'd, we'd all come from far and the bleeper had gone off and we'd all sort of gathered 
and for us it was it was London and then these these you know these geniuses would come you know Audrey Lord would come with her wise words and June Jordan would come with her wise words and Alice Walker would come with her wise words and we would all take what we needed and then we'd we'd rehuddle and we'd be talking about it and people would go away and they would do their creative version of who they were inspired by what they'd heard um and listened to and experienced um individually and corporately and I uh, and and for me I, I love June Jordan's um, alignment with the working class as well. I love her. I just, uh, I love the breadth of who she is and uh, her thisness. I love Absolutely. that thing about June Jordan. Yeah. And I remember, I remember like, those. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I remember those times, uh, the, the late 70s, early 80s, coming across a number of African American writers you know like like you said the wonderful wonderful audrey lords and sonia sanchez and pat barker yeah, yeah. Um, and michelle cliff and it, paulie it just, marshall uh, yeah paulie just, marshall yeah. yes praise song for the widow and it was just song for the widow yes that's right <laughs> i love her hanging over that boat in that praise song for the widow when she has this yeah. kind of cleansing of herself and she has yeah. almost an amazing rebirth but um yeah but it was like that and coming across the sister right bookshop or compendium oh, bookshop in london and all these alternative bookshops it was that, so that, exciting wasn't it yeah exactly where you could find all of these people and at that stage we didn't have that many um black british writers that we could easily find at that time no um, joan riley what happened to yeah. joan riley that's right that's right yeah. joan riley yes that's right and i think about one or two others but but not many but this this piece that you're going to read by june jordan is a tour of divorce it's an amazing an amazing piece of, of writing and it seems particularly apt to read at uh, this for you to read at this particular time in our lives 40 and I should also say, yeah i know and i should also say for for viewers out there that it does contain strong language so this is the first time in my life i've been able to give a strong language warning really quite exciting this piece contains strong language be warned from sea to shining sea one Natural order is being restored. Natural order means you take a pomegranate, that encapsulated plastic looking orb, complete with its little top, a childproof cap that you can neither twist nor turn. And you keep the pomegranate stacked inside a wobbly pyramid composed by 103 additional pomegranates next to a sign saying 89 cents each. Natural order is being restored. Natural order does not mean a pomegranate split open to the seeds, sucked by the tongue and lips, while teeth release the succulent sounds of its voluptuous disintegration. The natural order is not about a good time. This is not a good time to be against the natural order. Two, those black bitches tore it up. Yaggity yak, complain, complaints. Couldn't see no further than they gotta have this, they gotta have that, they gotta have my job, Jack, my job. To me, it was black man laid us wide open for the cut, busy telling us to go home. Sit tight, be sweet. So busy hang t hanging tail and chasing tail. They didn't have no time to take a good look at the real deal. Those macho bastards, they would rather blow the whole thing up than give a little. It was for, it was vote for spite, vote white for spite. Vulcan feminists turned themselves into bull dagger dykes and scared the shit out of decent small town people. That's what happened. Now, I don't even like niggers, but there they were, chewing into the middle of my paycheck and not me, but a lot of other white people just got sick of it sick of carrying the niggers. Old man run the government. You think that's their problem? Every one of them is old, and my parents, and the old people get out big numbers of them, voting for the dead. He's 18, just like all the rest. One thing he wants is a girl and a stereo and hanging out, hanging out. What does he care about the country? What does he care? Pomegranates, 89 cents each. 
frozen cans of orange juice, pre-washed spinach, onions by the bag, fresh pineapple with a printed message from the import company, cherry tomatoes by the box, scallions rubber banded by the bunch, frozen cans of orange juice, napkins available, no credit, please. Four, this is not such a hot time for you or for me. Five, natural order is being restored. Designer jeans will be replaced by the designer of the jeans. Music will be replaced by reproduction of the music. Food will be replaced by information. Above all, the flag is being replaced by the flag. Six, this was not a good time to be gay. Shortly before midnight, a Wednesday massacre felled eight homosexual Americans and killed two. One man was on his way to a delicatessen and the other was on his way to a drink. Using an Israeli submachine gun, the killer fired into the crowd, later telling police about the serpent in the garden of his bloody heart and so forth. This was not a good time to be black. Yesterday, the Senate passed an anti-busing rider and this morning, the next head of the Senate Judiciary said he would work to repeal the Voter Registration Act. And this afternoon, the Greensburg jury fully acquitted members of the Klan and the American Nazi Party in the murder of five citizens. And in Youngstown, Ohio, and in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and in Brooklyn, and in Miami, and in Salt Lake City, and in Portland, Oregon, and in Detroit, Michigan, and in Los Angeles, and in Buffalo, Black American, Black women and men were murdered, and the hearts of two of the victims were carved from the bodies of the victims, etc. This was not a good time to be old. Streamline of plans for the federal budget include elimination of Social Security as it now exists. Similarly, Medicare and Medicaid face severe reevaluation, among other things. This was not a good time to be young. Streamline of plans also include elimination of the Office of Education, and the military draft becomes a drastic concern as the national leadership boasts that this country will no longer be bullied and blackmailed by wars for liberation or wars for independence elsewhere on the planet and the like. This was not a good time to be a pomegranate ripening on a tree. This was not a good time to be a child. Suicide rates among the young reached all-time highs as the incidence of child abuse and sexual abuse rose dramatically across the nation. In Atlanta, Georgia, at least 28 black children have been murdered, with several more missing, and all of them feared dead or something of the sort. This is not a good time to be without a job. Unemployment, compensation, and the minimum wage have been identified as programs that plague the poor and the young who really require different incentives towards initiative, pluck, and so forth. This was not a good time to have a job. Promising to preserve traditional values of freedom, the new administration intends to remove safety regulations that interfere with maximal productivity potential etc. This was not a good time to be a woman. Pursuing the theme of traditional values of freedom, the new leadership has pledged its opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment. That would, in the words of the president, only throw the weaker sex into a vulnerable position among mischievous men and the like. This was not a good time to live in Queens. Trucks carrying explosive nuclear wastes will exit from the Long Island Expressway and then travel through residential streets of Queens en route to the 59th Street Bridge and so on. This was not a good time to live in Arkansas. Occasional explosions caused by mystery nuclear missiles have been cited as cause for local alarm, among other things. This was not a good time to live in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Given the presence of a United States nuclear missile base in Grand Forks, North Dakota, the non-military residents of the area feel that they live only a day-to-day -day distance from certain annihilation, etc. This was not a good time to be married. The Pope 
has issued directives concerning lust that make for difficult interaction between otherwise interested parties. This was not a good time not to be married. This was not a good time to buy a house at 18% interest. This was not a good time to rent housing on a completely decontrolled rental market. This was not a good time to be a Jew when the National Klan agenda targets Jews as well as Blacks among its enemies of the purity of the people. This was not a good time to be a tree. This was not a good time to be a river. This was not a good time to be found with a gun. This was not a good time to be found without one. This was not a good time to be gay. This was not a good time to be Black. This was not a good time to be a pomegranate or an orange. Orange. This was not a good time to be against the natural order. Wait a minute. Seven. Sucked by the tongue and the lips while the teeth release the succulence of all voluptuous disintegration. I am turning under the trees. I am trailing blood into the rivers. I am walking loud along the streets. I am digging my nails and my heels into the land. I am opening my mouth. I am just about to touch the pomegranates piled up precarious. This is a good time. This is the best time. This is the only time to come together, fractious, kicking, spilling, burly, whirling, raucous, messy, free, exploding like the seeds of natural disorder. June Jordan. Okay, and from June Jordan. Oh. <laughs> and from June Jordan, back to me. <laughs> back to Jackie K. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow. That was a that was a tour of divorce. What was that like to read? It's thrilling. Uh, we're so um well, I don't know about how you feel, but I feel um at the moment gosh i'm shouting i feel at the moment and i suppose through the combination of lockdown and trying to juggle your family and keep them together and keep work together and then the black lives matter thing and the murder of george floyd i feel and then watching birds in the garden and connecting with nature i feel that complete mix that i think the poem has of what you love and what you loathe and what you fear and what you fight against and what you hold on to. And I love that in the end, she says the only way to be free is to embrace natural disorder. <laughs> Break out like the seed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the way that she uses the pomegranate all the way through, she keeps oh, returning to that pomegranate yeah, as the seed. Yeah. Um, which is really, really brilliantly done. I remember hearing her read that and it was extraordinary the, the way that people seemed to get everything that she was saying in it. So there was a huge kind of um, uproarious response to, to her reading that, that poem live as if it spoke to people individually. This is not I a good so. time. This is not a good time. But also it begs the question, when is, when is the good time? When's the good time? Never. When? So mm. do it now. Be free now. Don't wait. Yeah, yeah, but it's that all embracing thing, isn't it? She just she folds us all into that conversation. Um, yeah, it reminds yeah, me of Audrey, Audrey Lord's The Litany for Survival, when at the end of it she says, So it's better to speak remembering we were never meant to, to survive. The, the idea that when you're silent, you're still afraid. Um, so it's better to speak out rather than to be silent because being silent doesn't help the fear. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's what we're also seeing in this time. I think everybody's lost a layer of skin at the moment. So people yeah. are just, there's a sort of, tr there's a truth telling happening on a industrial scale at the moment. Uh, absolutely. I remember being, a, being invited to, to Berkeley, um, the University of Berkeley once, and June Jordan was, was there. She, was, she, was, she taught there. And so did Angela Davis. And um, meeting her and um, not that long ago as an adult was it was a huge thrill but it, it made me think as that poem did of the huge 
impact that, that poets um, from the whole American civil rights movement made on, on us on us here. So I thought I'd read th this poem that comes from a kind of childhood experience of having a poster of Angela Davis on, on my wall in response to your June Jordan poem. On my bedroom wall is a big poster of Angela Davis, who's in prison right now for nothing at all, except she wouldn't put up with stuff. My mum says she's only 26, which seems really old to me, but my mum says it's young. Just imagine, she says, being on America's 10 most wanted people's list at 26, I can't. Angela Davis is the only person I've seen, except for a nurse on TV who looks like me. She has big hair like mine that grows out instead of down. My mum says it's called an Afro. If I could be as brave as her when I get older, I'll be okay. Last night, I kissed her goodnight again. I wondered if she could feel the kisses in prison all the way from Scotland. Her skin is the same too, you know. I can see my skin is that colour, but most of the time I forget. So sometimes when I look in the mirror, I give myself a bit of a shock and say to myself, do you really look like this? I wonder if she does that. I don't believe she killed anybody. My dad said it's all a load of phony lies. I asked my dad, if she'll get the chair, like them rosebudies he was telling me about. No, he says, the world is on her side. Well, how come she's in there then, I thinks. I worry she's going to get the chair. I worry she's worrying about the chair. My dad says she'll be putting on a brave face. He brought me a badge home, which I wore to school. It says, free Angela Davis. And all my pals says, Who's she? That could make me cry. Actually, Aww. I'm a bit teary jacked. Aww. Yeah. It's it it uh it, it's just that that thirstiness to see someone that looks like you. Like thirst to see someone. And um mm. you know, I I I I don't think we lose that remembrance of that thirst in our capacities, in the stuff that we do. There's, I know. you know. Uh, that's absolutely true. And another um, poet, um, African-American poet that's made a, an impact on you is the wonderful poet, Angela Weld Grimmicke, who died in 1958. And well, I think she was, I think she was gay or her work seems to, seem to, seem to imply that she was gay. Um, absolutely. But she wasn't open yeah, but she wasn't openly gay in the way that it was possible to um, be openly gay if she'd been born a, um, a couple of decades later. Yeah. Yes, um, Angelina Weld Grimke. I'm absolutely fascinated by her. In fact, I've, um, I've, she was the first, she, hers is the first play published by a black woman that we have. Uh, it's called Rachel, and I'm going to do something with it. Wow, oh, wonderful. I, she, I love her. Anyway. This is Rosabel. Uh, we think it was, we think, the people, well, I don't know if you can see that, this is from Homegirls, which is still the most wonderful black feminist anthology. Um, anyway, uh, the writers of Homegirls think that she wrote this probably in the early 1900s, and it absolutely speaks into her loving women. It's called Rosabel, or Rosalie. Leaves that whisper, whisper ever, Listen, listen, pray. Birds that twitter, twitter softly, do not say me nay. Winds that breathe about, upon her, lines I do not dare. Whisper turtle, breathe upon her, that I find her fair. Rose whose soul unfolds, white petaled, touch her soul, use white. Rose whose thoughts unfold gold petaled, blossom in her sight. Rose whose heart unfolds red petaled, prick her slow heart stir, tell her white, gold red, my love is, and for her, for her. That's one by Angelina Welch Grimke. And uh, we have another one. This is called Under the Days. And I think this is the one 
that um, Catherine was thinking about when she chose that first song. The days fall upon me. One by one they fall. Like leaves, they are black. They are gray. They are white. They are shot through with gold and fire. They fall. They fall ceaselessly. They cover me. They crush. They smother. Who will ever find me under the days? And again, the writers talk about um, Grim K living a buried life. Um, yeah, I think she felt buried by her predicament of being um, a woman and black in Harlem in the 1920s. She was part of the um, Harlem Renaissance. And, you know, if lesbian, which one assumes, then triply disenfranchised at that time. But I love her stuff and um, I'd like to... Uh, I'd like to unbury her. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to unbury her. So that's, that's her. And now we have, um, this is from a, a book called A Gathering of Spirit, which is a collection of writings by North American First Nation um, people, women, sorry. And this is called To the Spirit of Mona Seta. And I'll tell you a bit about who she is after I've read it. To the spirit of Mona Seta. To the spirit of Mona Seta and to all women who have been forced to the ground from the banks of the Conche. There is death in this river. You can hear it speak. The people fishing or watching the great birds nest in shallow coves cannot hear it. They have not been made to listen. I have seen the eagles and cast for fish, but there is something else here. The mystery that speaks of life and death and rebirth has been stretched to its limits. Violence has imposed new conditions. If I could, I would pull the death from this river. If I could, I would fling it to the sky, but today the clouds hang bruised and battered as if saying they too have had enough. For downstream, a woman's body was found, delivered naked and nameless into the river's lap. My fingers claw wet clay, touch earth, touch earth. If you get lost, Touch earth. If the wind changes directions or you are caught midstream, touch earth. When violence hits you, touch deep, for that is where it strikes. The place, the moment when the killer and his instrument become one. Cold, lifeless metal held to my throat, hand digging in pain. I close my eyes to push back the memory, but there is no stopping it, no force of mind, no threat of retaliation. Victims are stripped of will. Only the sheer nothingness of a star breaking into a million pieces, falling, scattering, and the sound that only those who have heard a, sta a star fall can hear. If I could, I would heal you. Ushwaka, woman's self, and we would walk again without fear, without stumbling. We would walk together, you and I, and talk about this and that, but not about what we have in common. We could forget, and the river would be as it once was. At night, the river flows silently past my bed while the full moon echoes across my floor. Be whole again, little one. Be whole.
So that was written by a woman called Charlotte de Clou. And there's a little bit about Charlotte de Clou. Like most of the contributors to this book, she wasn't a professional writer. She was from the Osage tribe, First Nation tribe. And she says, I'm 34 and was born Enid, Oklahoma. Born in Enid, Oklahoma. I am a wife and a mother and now live in Lawrence, Kansas. So nothing about her as a writer, but she wrote that poem because Mona Seta, um, the, 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 the story of Mona Seta is, is well known in America. She was um, called the concealed wife of General Custer, you know, little bighorn General Custer. Um, and they uh, had a child together. I suspect that Charlotte de Clou, she talks about um, the spirit of Monaceta and all women who have been forced to the ground. So I suspect that Charlotte de Clou doesn't think that it was necessarily a willing coming together of those two. He was, of course, married. Um, yes, so she was from the Cheyenne tribe, Monaceta, and uh, this this story persists about her and General Custer and the the son that was born, um, and then what happened to the descendants of of these two. So there we are, Monaceta, James Jordan. Um, I suppose they're sort of memorialising, um, these writers are memorialising the lives of people who um, until comparatively recently have, have not been memorialised. Um, and I, I, I find that very moving, all these hidden, hidden lives. And um, this, this uh, my final piece, this is um, from Troilus and Cressida. It's a speech from Ulysses. Ulysses uh, uh, was with um, the Greeks who were trying to storm the walls of Troy and they, and they breached an impasse. The whole play takes place in the middle of a seven years war, uh, a, a, a war that's, we're seven years into the war rather, nothing is happening. Ulysses is the wily fox and it's his job to encourage their main fighter, Achilles, to get back out there and Fight, fight those Trojans. Time hath, my lord, a wallet at his back, wherein he puts arms for oblivion, a great sized monster of ingratitudes. Those scraps are good deeds past, which are devoured as fast as they are made, forgot as soon as done. Perseverance, dear my lord, keeps honour bright. To have done is to hang quite out of fashion, like a rusty mail in monumental mockery. Keep then the path, for emulation hath a thousand sons that one by one pursue. If you give way, like to an entered tide, they all rush by and leave you hindmost then what they do in present, though less than yours in past, must o'ertop yours. For time is like a fashionable host that slightly shapes his parting guest by the hand and with his arms outstretched as he would fly, grasps in the comma. The welcome ever smiles and farewell goes out sighing. Let not virtue Seek remuneration for the thing it was. For beauty, wit, high birth, vigour of bone, desert in service, love, friendship, charity, are subject all to envious and calumnating time. One touch of nature makes the whole world kin, that all with one consent praise the newborn gods, though they are made and moulded of things past, and give to dust that is a little guilt more lord than guilt or dusted. The present eye praises the present object. Good old Shakespeare. 
never out of fashion, always has something to say to us. I just think of this, I think of um, Ulysses saying this, saying, you know, trying to really work on Achilles. And I just think of him, sort of there's a bit of him going, you know, I was the coming man once. And let me tell you, you're not the coming man always. So grasp <laughs> your moment, because I tell you now. And it's just that thing of going, you know, what, what's hot and new and fresh? And, and, you know, all of us of a certain age going, yeah. I was hot and new and fresh <laughs> once upon a time. You know, and I just think Shakespeare gets that so brilliantly. And it's a timeless sort of um, response. It, it totally is. And that was just really brilliantly, brilliantly read. It was fantastic. Just well, brilliantly acted. It was just fantastic. But that, that idea of time being a fashionable host, it feels so current, it feels so fresh. It's always, a, yeah. it's, a, it's always a surprise. I mean, that's why Shakespeare is a genius that, that Shakespeare is. It's always a surprise to come across just about anything that you could have ever thought about anything at all being somewhere in Shakespeare. Um, I know. Whatever, whatever that be, whatever I you know. think about it amazing yeah yeah such such, yeah. such a genius um it's, it's interesting as well that because all of these pieces in a sense connected to time and to ancestry and to kind of honoring our ancestors in various different ways each and every one of them connected to, to time um at a tangent in some way yes. and yes. And, uh, and and time feels a, it is a slippery host <laughs> it is something that yeah. we're always trying to catch and forever yeah. running yeah. after and we're, yeah. we're, we're forever also trying to remember ourselves at different ages um as we shift and change ourselves and grow into yeah. the self we're about to become sort of looking backwards and forwards simultaneously and one of the things I, I love about the work that you've chosen at uh, tonight is it, it gives us that whole sense of, of the vari the variables of time yeah I, 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 I yeah I was just thinking about that and thinking that um time for me it doesn't it's not linear it feels very uh, vertical in a way because I I still feel like that three-year-old that sussed out what I needed to do for lemon cardigan Daphne it, it feels do you know what I mean it's almost like we are all that time is is with us all the time it's sort of we're, we're sort of traveling that way but with this deepening well of experience that um that is all all one time as we're traveling through time if that makes and, sense that's no, sort of, i feel like i carry all of that you know the three-year-old and the six anxious 16 year old they're all chugging away <laughs> i know they're all part. They're all part of you, and they're all in you, yeah. and they all continue yeah. to see things. Uh, so you, you can continue to look at things through that three-year-old eyes as, as well yeah, as through your absolutely. own eyes, and it's it's like having simultaneous eyes, simultaneous receiving things. Like all. the pomegranate seeds, all these mm. little pieces that make up the whole. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's just been such a delight to hear them, these pieces that are so important. And the, the idea that these these pieces that you've chosen um, have been your companions. They've, they've been your choices. Yeah. The people that you've yeah. chosen along your journey through time. Yeah. Um, they've been your companions and your solace and your, your escapes and your endorsements and your encouragement and your inspiration. And uh, all of these things all at once at, at different yeah. times. Yeah, your, absolutely. How lovely, how fortunate, how blessed to have this um this library alongside all the time. It's um yeah, I uh what a lovely thing. This mm. is a lovely thing that you're doing here. It's really lovely, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, yeah. I think it's it's time for us to invite Catherine back and to hear her next next song. Um Catherine, welcome back into our Zoom room. Here she is. How did how did you like that, Catherine? How did you like Adria's pieces there? Incredible, honestly. Just the deliverance of each poem was so engaging, you know? Like I couldn't take my eyes off the screen. It was it wasn't just like listening to somebody read out a poem, it was like a whole performance. It was incredible. And you have such a beautiful voice as well. Oh my goodness. Mm. <laughs> oh, just no, no, not in your company. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Catherine, you're going to sing next for us a really wonderful song called Four Marys, which seems to sort of link in, in, a, in a lovely way 
as well to the idea of stories and ancestry and and, and characters and, and passing on things well it was when when obviously um you and Adria were talking earlier about the way that a song holds a specific point in time for us and takes us back to a point in our lives for me this is one of those songs um i learned it when i was like 10 years old nine ten something like that and my primary school was putting on like a scottish day where people would read poems and sing songs and things and i remember coming home and telling my parents and being really excited like oh i get to audition to sing a solo and my dad sat me down and at 10 years old he was like cap you need a stick you need a stick that's what you need if you want to be recognized anyway you need a stick so he was like sing a scottish folk song and they'll love it and you'll get picked so i did i learned this song didn't get picked but it's all right it's all now, 10 years ago, I'm over it, clearly. <laughs> just, every time I, sing, I just think about sort of like 10 year old me stomping around like, oh, I, that part. I sang a traditional song and she sang Katy Perry, what's going on? <laughs> oh, for this, goodness oh. sake. <laughs> what poor taste they had. <laughs> look at me now. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, this is your chance now. now. <laughs> There's always the right moment for something, so this is clearly the right moment. <laughs> uh, yeah, it says four Marys. Last night there were four Marys. Tonight there'll be but three. There was Mary Seaton and Mary Beaton. And Mary Carmichael and me. Oh, little did my mother know when she gave me bread that I should go so far from home and die a shameful death. Oh, often have I dressed my queen, put on her bra silk gown. But all the thanks I've got tonight is to be hanged in Edinburgh town. Full often have I dressed my queen, put gold upon her head and all the thanks i have today is the gallows to be my share oh happy happy is the maid born of beauty free oh it was my rosy dim cheeks that's been the devil to me they'll tie a handkerchief round my eyes so I may not see day and they'll never tell my mother dear that the tie am across the sea Last night there were four Marys, tonight there'll be but three. There was Mary Seaton and Mary Beaton and Mary Carmichael and me. <laughs> Oh, that was fantastic, wasn't it? Wasn't that fantastic? Oh Adrian? gosh, that was sublime. Thank you. It's so beautiful. Oh my gosh, all these all these ladies having a horrible time. I, know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I didn't even yeah. really realize what the song was about until like last year when I read about you know what it was actually about. And I thought, why did my parents let me learn that? That's a bit. Yeah, but why did <laughs> they pick Katy Perry? What was wrong with your primary school? <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> that day, I think. <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. What do you think your ten-year-old self did think it was about? You know, can you remember what you what you thought the song was about? No, I mean, I didn't know what a gallow was. I didn't know what any of these little references were. I think I just thought it was about like a queen or something. You know, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I read I read up about it last year, and I was like, oh no, <laughs> that's a bit sad. <laughs>
<laughs> that, that's made me think that we also come into things, don't we? We often hear, hear things or we hear words long before we know their meaning and then we kind of yeah. walk into them or our lives walk into them and, and we discover them as if completely afresh, but something in our kind of distant memory remembers them somehow, remembers the first lodging of, of an idea, of a word way back when. And yeah. so, and, and I think that in, in that sense, you know, you're, you're absolutely right, Adjo, with your sense of, of time, not, not being like this, but being more vertical. We, we pile yeah. things up and we have to dig down deep to, yeah. to find in these Quake things. it. Yes. Yeah. Quake them up and, and through again. Quake them but, up. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, this has just been a real delight to, to have you, Adria Ando, on Macker to Macker. And it's Thanks been really fantastic. Me. <laughs> it was a pleasure. <laughs> and, and it was really fantastic, um, Catherine Philpott, for you to be back and, and joining us with your absolutely sublime, as Adria called it, voice. Really, really wonderful to have you both, and you're a lovely um, combination together. Uh, Adria is going to tell us who next week's Mackers oh, are. Oh, I am be. going to tell you who next week's Mackers are. We have. The next week's Mackers are Colin Maguire and Ross Wilson. Fantastic. And they're going to be joined by the absolutely wonderful, the fantastic Suzanne Bonner. And we're going to oh, be wow. doing a kind of NHS special because all of us, in one way or another, have worked for the NHS at different points in our lives. I used to be a hospital porter at uh, Westminster Hospital, which was an extraordinary period. I think um, when I met you, I was a hospital porter and yep. with, bright green, with bright green hair. That's right. <laughs> had if to you haven't had green hair, get out. <laughs> had to get that changed in case it frightened the patients. Um, but anyway, it's been really wonderful um, <laughs> having you. And Adria, would you tell us what your favourite bookshop is just before you go? Yes. Well, you know, lots of the bookshops we've loved have gone to the wall, haven't they, over the years. Um, but this is a shop called Bookmongers, and it's in Brixton. And it's run by um, a Bostonian man called Patrick. And he um, had a dog called Rosa, who always used to sit in the window, a bright red dog. She was quite a scary looking dog, but she was lovely. And it, it's, a, it's a secondhand bookshop. It has sofas in there. You can, well, obviously not at the moment, but you know, in normal times, you can just go and noodle in there. And Patrick has an encyclopedic knowledge of everything in the shop. And it has everything you could possibly imagine from encyclopedias to poetry to, um, you know, anything you could want. So um, I'm, I'm nominating that because I just think we have to hold on to our, our bookshops. We absolutely do. We have to hold on to our bookshops and we have to hold on to our theatres and we have to hold on to our love of poetry and song. So this has been a really rich and heady mix of poetry and song with everything thrown in. Wonderful from, from Shakespeare to Willy Sainka to Angela Well Gurmukhi to jo June Jordan to Gerald Manley Hopkins. It's been fantastic to A.A. Mill. It's been absolutely <laughs> wonderful journey and wonderful to have your songs too. Catherine, thank you very much. And a huge thank you to our sponsors for making this possible. And Macker to Macker is supported by and hosted by the National Theatre of Scotland, by Edinburgh International Book Festival, by the School of Arts and Media at the University of Salford, and by Home Manchester. And without all of them, we wouldn't have been able to pay the writers, the Mackers of the Week, or the singers. So a huge big thank you um, to them, and a massive thank you at home if this is your first time um, joining us a very very warm, warm welcome to you and if this is several times that you've been to Mecca and Mecca an even warmer welcome to you I'll see you <laughs> next week bye bye thank you for joining bye. us